Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online service here at Emmanuel Pentecostal Tabernacle. We're so glad that you joined with us today, and we trust that you will sense and feel God's presence as you worship along with us, and that He will speak to your life through His Word today. We're going to have some worship from our worship team today, so we encourage you to worship along with us in your homes, and then we're going to be hearing from the Word of God. So take some time today, worship the Lord, thank Him for His goodness in our lives. Let's have a word of prayer together as we open our service. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come into your presence, that we can worship you in our homes through this online platform. We ask and invite your Holy Spirit to visit us now as we worship you and give you the glory. And may you speak into the lives of every individual who's listening and watching today. We ask these things in your name and for your glory. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today, and we trust that you enjoyed the worship time. At this time, we're going to look into the message. And this morning, I want to share a message that I've entitled, What's So Amazing About God's Grace? And our scripture reading is found in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. And these words simply say this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Amazing a word that we often use to describe many different things, whether that be something we see or something we experience. 
The dictionary defines amazing as something that causes great surprise, wonder, or astonishment. We often use this word to describe such things as that breakfast we had was amazing. The sunset is amazing. It's an amazing view. It's amazing that someone would do that for me. My trip was amazing. And my personal favorite and really one every husband should use, my wife is amazing. I read an article a little while ago that was entitled, The Most Amazing Things to See and Experience in the United States of America. And on the list were such things as the Grand Canyon in Arizona, the volcanoes in Hawaii, the National Mall in Washington, the Everglades and Disney World in Florida, and the biggest game of them all, the Super Bowl, which in my opinion should be on the top of the list as I would love to go to the Super Bowl. When we do see or experience something that leaves us astonished or in wonder, the one word we use to sum it up that seems to capture it best is amazing. Have you ever experienced, saw, or did something that you would classify as amazing? I'm sure we all have. I have witnessed a few things in my lifetime that I would classify as amazing. You guys probably wouldn't know this, but I love sports. I love hockey. Go Leafs go. And I love football. I've been to two NFL games in my lifetime. A couple years ago my wife and I were in Florida and during this time there we took a tour of an NFL stadium in Jacksonville, Florida. During this tour we got to visit the media booths where the broadcasters would call the games from. We got to visit the uh, locker rooms. We got to visit the owners booth and we got to even go down next to the field. I remember looking up and seeing all the seats, the stadium could sit 70,000 people, which was hard for me to fathom that so many people could be in one place. For a football fan like myself though, that was quite the experience. It was simply amazing. However, for my wife, she was a little reluctant to go at first because she's not a football fan like myself. I remember trying to convince her to go and I remember saying to her, think about how amazing it will be to see all the stuff that we will get to see on that day. Though she agreed, she wasn't truly convinced that she was going to enjoy the experience. But after experiencing it for herself, she agreed with me that it was an amazing experience. In life, many times, we don't understand how amazing something is until we truly experience it for ourselves. Someone can tell us, someone can try to explain it to us, but until we experience it for ourselves, we don't truly understand how amazing it is. And that's the way it is with the grace of God. We didn't understand what was so amazing about it. Some of us knew the words to the hymn, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. But we asked the question, grace, what's so amazing about grace? Isn't grace just something we say before we have our meal? Grace, isn't that something that's too good to be true? But then one day we who know Jesus came in contact and experienced the grace of God for ourselves. And then we knew what the hymn writer John Newton was talking about when he penned the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When we experienced it for ourselves, we understood how amazing it truly is. And I want to say this morning that the grace of God is still amazing. I've been serving the Lord now for over 16 years and today I'm more amazed at God's grace than I've ever been because it's His grace that has saved me. It's His grace that has kept me. It's His grace that forgave me when I failed along the way. When I felt weak and felt like giving up in this journey, it was His grace that was sufficient for me and gave me power in my weakness to keep going. It's His grace that has gotten me through everything in my life this far and it's by His grace that I'm going to make it through this life and make it home to heaven one day. The man who wrote our text, Paul, understood 
how amazing the grace of God was. And Paul wanted everyone to know about this amazing grace. So the question is this morning, what makes God's grace so amazing? And the first truth that Paul gives us that makes God's grace so amazing is the reality that it is grace that saves us. Verse 11 again. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. First of all, what is grace? In short, it means unmerited or undeserved favor. It means showing or giving blessing, favor, or kindness to someone who does not deserve it. Have you ever gotten something you didn't deserve? In my life, I can probably give you more than one example of getting something I didn't deserve, but one example stands out. When I was in Bible college, uh, there was a policy that stated that if you miss more than four of the same class without permission from the professor, then you would fail that course. Now, one of my least favorite courses was philosophy. And this course was at Tuesday and Thursday mornings at 8 a.m. It was getting towards the end of the semester, and let's just say I had already missed four philosophy classes. I figured I paid to miss those classes, so I was going to miss them. Our final major paper was due, and the professor said that if you emailed him the paper a week in advance, he would give you a 15% bonus. I needed that extra 15%, let me tell you. So I determined in my heart I was going to get it and I was going to get that paper done a week in advance. The night before the paper was due, I stayed up until 4.30 a.m. to complete it. I was tired, but I felt good about the paper. I emailed the paper and I went to bed. The next time I opened my eyes, it was 9.15. Class started at 8 a.m., so now it was 9.15. I jumped out of bed and got to school as fast as I could. The class was already over. I had missed my fifth one, and just my luck, I met the professor in the hallway. I tried to make small talk. I mean, maybe he wouldn't notice that I wasn't there or something. I walked up to him with a big smile on my face and said, Sir, did you get my paper? And he said, Yes, I did, but I don't think it matters because according to my records, you just failed my class. My heart sank. I didn't know what I was going to do. He said, Come see me around 10.30. For the next hour, I worried, I prayed, and somehow came to grasp the possibility that I may have to redo that class, which means I wouldn't graduate on time unless there was some intervention. I went to see him at 10.30. The meeting started with the professor explaining the policy to me and how I was in breach of it and how, for that reason, I was a worthy candidate for the punishment of the policy that I had broken. I hung my head and I expected his next words to be, I'm sorry, Jerry, but we have no other option but to fail you. But his next words were, but before we fail you, I have one question. I want you to be honest with me. Did you miss any of my classes because you were sick? And I said, I missed one, but I have no proof. To which he responded, I'm going to take your word for it. And because of that, I'm going to have grace on you and I'm not going to fail you. Now in my heart in that moment, I was filled with such joy and gratitude and thankfulness. But here's the point of that story. I deserve to fail that course. I had broken and disobeyed the policy. I was worthy of the punishment. But because my professor had grace on me, he didn't give me what I deserved, but rather what I didn't deserve. And folks, that's what Paul is reminding us here in our text. That because of the grace of God, none of us get what we deserve. Instead, what we don't deserve. You and I were sinners. We broke God's policy, as it were. We had fallen short of His standard for how we ought to live, and we all deserve judgment, condemnation, and to be separated from Him for eternity. We deserve that punishment. We were worthy candidates. 
but because God loved you and I so much, grace appeared in the form of a person named Jesus who came to this world for one purpose, and that was to take our sin, our punishment, what we were worthy of upon himself, and be nailed to a cross, shed his blood, suffer and die, and on that third day rise again victorious over sin. Christ defeated and overcame that which made us worthy candidates of God's judgment and condemnation. And even though we didn't deserve it, because He loved us so much, He extended the gracious invitation to us to come to Him to get what we don't deserve. Isaiah 1 and 18 says, Come and settle the manner. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. In other words, because of my grace, God says, I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. Forgiveness for all of your sin, a relationship with me, and eternal life. If you're saved today, you're listening to me, you know Jesus. Aren't you glad that you accepted the gracious invitation of the Savior? Aren't you glad that today you get what you don't deserve? And if you're glad for that today, why not write Amen in the comment section this morning? But the reality is, the invitation, if you have not yet accepted God's gift of amazing grace, still rings out to you today. It's still extended to you today. And you can experience it for yourself today. This concept of grace, that we don't get what we deserve, is so hard for many of us to grasp because we couldn't do anything to earn His grace. And much of our world works on a merit or good work system. If you do well in school, you will get good grades. If you do well in sports, you will get awards. If you work hard at your job, you'll get a promotion or a raise. Even in some of the church, there's a teaching that if we add our good works to Christ's work, we can exceed, achieve salvation. Folks, allow me to remind you this morning that we could do nothing to earn God's grace. We could not achieve salvation in our own merit. It doesn't matter how good from a moral standpoint we are. It doesn't matter how many good works we do. It doesn't matter how much we attend church. It doesn't matter how much money we give, as good as all that is, and we should be doing those things. We have no right to puff ourselves up because it is through God's grace and grace alone that we have salvation. And we have no right to puff ourselves up. Because in light of receiving salvation, the Bible tells us that in the sight of God, all of our good works, all of our helping others, all of our, our, our giving money, as good as all those things are, the Bible tells us that our righteousness only amounts to filthy rags. In essence, absolutely nothing. The only way that we could receive salvation was through His grace and accepting Christ into our hearts. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 2 that if we could achieve it out of our goodness, good works, or keeping the law, then Christ died for nothing. I mean, think about it. If we could do it in and of ourselves, if we could somehow balance the scale between our goodness and our sin that would grant us eternal life, then why would Christ come and die? Why would He suffer and go through all that He went through? The truth is, He did it because we could not do it. And the only way we could achieve salvation is by accepting the gift of God's undeserved grace. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For it is by grace that you are saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, lest any person can boast. It is the gift of God. Paul says in this verse, and this is a very important point in our text verse this morning, But the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All men. So let me make something perfectly clear. This doesn't mean that everyone will be saved, but it does mean that His grace that gives us salvation is for everyone. 
And that's the second truth that makes grace amazing. Is that God's grace, this wonderful gift, is for everyone. In the context of this passage, in the verses prior, Paul makes mention of older men, older women, younger men, and younger women, slaves, and even those whom the world despises. And then he says, the grace that brings salvation to all men or all people has appeared. Folks, the gift of God's undeserved grace is not for a select few. It's not for a certain denomination or a people group. The gift of God's undeserved grace is for the whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. It's for the whoever will invite Christ into their heart because grace has come for everyone. Every tribe, every race, every gender, every age, every social status, the rich, the poor, the middle class, the marginalized, his gift of grace is for all people. It doesn't matter if you are a good moral person. It doesn't matter if you are respected in society. It doesn't matter if you are successful in the business world. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, the gift of God's grace is for you. And you might be listening to me today and be thinking, Pastor, but, but I've messed up so much. I, I've done too much wrong. I, I can't experience God's grace now. Let me remind you, Jesus has come for everyone. And there's not one person who is beyond the reach of His grace. For the Word of God tells us in Isaiah 59 and 1, Surely, surely, the arm of the Lord is not too short that He cannot save. The bottom line is, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, no matter what the external circumstances may be or the reasoning, then God extends and longs to give you His gift of grace. I mean, look at Paul, the individual who wrote this verse. He, he was a persecutor. He was a murderer as he killed Christians. He hated God and everything to do with him. He classified himself as the chief of sinners, which is the worst of the worst. But one day on the Damascus Road, he met Christ and experienced the grace of God that saved him and transformed his life. And so here's one thing that I know, that the chief of sinners, Paul, the worst of the worst, could experience God's grace, so can you. And here's another thing that I know, that if I, yes, even I, can experience the grace of God, so can you. But Because here's the reality, despite your past, despite your mistakes, despite your sin, God's desire, God's will is to have a relationship with you. God's desire is to forgive you. God's desire is that you would spend eternity in heaven with Him. He longs for you to experience His gift of grace. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you have done, God wants you to experience His grace. And my friend, that's what makes grace so amazing. So as I bring this message to a close this morning, you might be listening this morning and you may say, Pastor, that's a wonderful thought. It all sounds too good to be true. And you don't know my past. You don't know what I'm caught up in. You don't know my lifestyle. You're right, I don't. But I know one who knows every detail about your life. He knows you're coming and you're going. The Bible tells us he knows how many hair you have on your head. He knows your struggles. He knows your mistakes. He knows every detail about your life. And yet he still extends his gift of undeserved grace towards you because he loved you and he died on the cross for you. He did it knowing everything about you and while you look at your life and think it's too much for God, it's too messy, or you're too sinful. My Bible tells me in Romans 5 and 20 that where sin abound, His grace abounds even more. And God extends His great, gracious invitation to you to come to Him and He will forgive you. He will transform you and give you abundant and eternal life. The question is, will you receive it today? Will you receive the gift of God's amazing grace? Only you can make that choice. But if you're listening today and you come to the conclusion that you want to experience God's grace, 
You want to give Jesus your life. That you want to have your sins forgiven and be sure of heaven. You want to experience God's amazing grace for yourself. You don't want to just hear about it anymore. You want to experience how amazing it is for yourself. Then why not pray this prayer after me this morning? Dear Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. Come into my heart. Forgive me and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you please contact us through our Facebook page or contact me directly. We want to help you and we want to celebrate with you for making the best decision you will ever make. At this time, before we have our closing prayer this morning, we're going to hear another song of worship from the worship team. And as they lead us, I encourage you to take this time in your homes to worship and thank God for His gift of amazing grace. So this morning, let's do that together as the worship team leads us.
Thank you for joining us today. We trust that you felt the presence of God as you worshiped along with us, and we also trust that the Lord spoke to you uh, through the message today. We encourage you to join us again next week at 11 a.m. right here on our Facebook page. Uh, we'll be having another service here together. We encourage you to share our service on your page and maybe someone in your friends list that may be looking for this uh, service or may need to hear this service. And your share may be the means of them uh, hearing a message or, or through the worship that may speak into their lives. So we trust that you will share this service as well. We're going to take a moment to close in prayer this morning and ask God's blessing upon all your lives. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to gather in your presence through this online platform. I ask your blessing upon every individual uh, who's watching today or will watch in the coming days. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would surround them with your presence, and that you would strengthen them. No doubt, Lord, there is many uh, who is listening today or in the days ahead that are a representation of a need that they have in their life. I pray, God, that you would minister to them by your spirit. You would minister to that need by your spirit right now. Lord, many are, are facing needs and circumstances that they uh, cannot uh, face them or handle them or get through them on their own. They can't fix the problem. But, oh God, we know that we serve a God who can fix the problem, who can make a way where there seems to be the way, who can do the impossible. So, Lord, in, in each and every uh, situation today, I pray that you would minister by your spirit, that you would do uh, what only you can do. I pray, God, that you would minister healing to those who need healing. I pray that you would minister uh, comfort to those who are going through times of sorrow and loss. I pray that you would minister peace right now. I pray, God, that you would give strength and power to those who feel weak and powerless and, and perhaps feel like giving up. I pray right now for a fresh touch of your spirit upon their lives. Lord, for all of us, may you continue to journey with us. May we continue to be uh, aware of your presence with us. God, may you bless us and help us to continue to serve you and to live for you in this day. I again ask for your blessing upon every individual. And Lord, may you keep us safe and protected in your love. And we'll give you all the glory for you and you alone are worthy. We ask these things in your name and for your glory. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you here again next week. Have a great week, everyone.